Today, we're going to be talking about planning a training session. So let's get into it. G'day everyone, Coach Greg Rowe from the OzSwish YouTube channel and OzSwish Academy here with you for another episode of The Coach Approach. Today, we're going to be focused on session plans. The old adage of failing to plan is planning to fail is absolutely true for most sports. If you ask any coach that's a veteran of the sport that they coach, they're going to tell you that it's very important that you plan your training session. So if you're a beginner coach, today I'm going to be sharing with you some of the approaches that I take in planning a session for my basketball academy. And I've evolved some of the things I do over years. So hopefully I'll be able to fast track a little bit of your learning, exposing you to some of the things that I actually do. So make sure you stick around. Also, at the end of this video, I'll be throwing in a little bit of information. Well, actually, more than information, I'll be giving you access to an OzSwish template, a training session plan template. If you're a new coach and a beginner coach, sometimes it can be overwhelming to work out what you need to do at your very first training session. So one of the very first things you need to do is take a step back and the very first thing you should be looking at before you even put pen to paper is your resources. So the very first thing you need to know is how many kids you've got and what level they're at. So that your first resource is actually the people that you're going to be working with. So you need to know those numbers. Sometimes as a beginner coach, you know, when you're just starting out, those numbers are uncertain. You may have a group that you coach, but from week to week, you may not know how many kids you're going to have. So one of the most important things you can do early is lay down some rules around if someone's not going to be coming to the training session, you need to ask them to advise you of that. Because one of the biggest problems with coaching is you arrive, you've got a session plan and you're ready to go and you think you're going to have 10 kids and you've got all these drills that require you to have 10 kids. And then what you find is, oh, damn, I was going to swear then, but oh, damn, I do not um, have the number of kids that I thought I'd have at this session. So that's the first thing is how many people are you catering to? One of my approaches is I always look to wind back the numbers of the drills based on previous sessions. But if it's your first session, you may not be fully aware of the number of kids. So you want to have a plan B strategy if you're starting out with your very first session. So one of the plan B strategies I have is always to plan drills for slightly less numbers than my maximum number. And also I encourage my athletes and their parents to notify me in advance as to whether they're going to be coming to training. And obviously some things are unforeseen and you may not always get those messages on time, but you need to understand how many bodies you're going to have at training because that'll determine exactly what you'll be able to do as far as training drills go. But other resources that are important to consider before putting pen to paper, how many balls will you have and or how many will you need to do the drills and activities that you have planned? You also need to know in my sport, baskets. How many baskets are available? Because if you've got more than two baskets, like one at each end, that means you can do more and you can break kids up. You also need to know if you need any other resources like witches' hats and ladders and cones and any sort of equipment that you may add that you need to help teach the skills that you need to teach your kids. So those are the things you need to consider. Then you've got your duty of care stuff to consider before you even put pen to paper, which is things like extra supervisors. If you have a large number of kids, can you handle them all? And what if something happens? And with kids, it quite often does. So one of the other things you might need on hand is a first aid kit, uh, some ice, uh, and also incident report forms. One of the requirements that we have here with our coaches at most associations in Australia is that you would have an incident report form, and that includes schools as well. So if someone gets hurt, you record everything in the first aid that was applied and keep that as a record. All right, so that's the first part is your resources. What do you do? Share in the comments below whether you consider those resources. And if I've missed any, and I'm sure I have, then you know, feel free to mention some others that you think are important around uh, you know, considering 
your session. Let's look at our session structure here. So if we're going to look at a training session plan, one of the very first things, once I know what my resources are, when athletes arrive, I like to build rapport. So I'll make sure that I'm always shaking their hands and acknowledging them by name. One of the things that you'll find parents absolutely love is when you call their kids by their name. So very first session, I'm all about learning names. I'm learning the names of the athletes, but I'm running drills that allow my athletes to also learn each other's names. So at Oswush, our training session follows a core pattern and has for a long time. I've been coaching 30 years and I have tended to stick to a similar format. So very first thing, once we know what our resources are, we're going to look at our warm up. So what we do is we do what we call a dynamic warm up. Back in the day when I was younger, we actually used to do static warm ups. Well, these days our warm up approach is a lot different to when I was a kid. So we get blood flowing to the areas that a lot most likely to be used while uh, participating in an activity. So one of the big things we're huge on here at Oswish are lunge clocks and lunges, because in our game, we do a lot of driving and a lot of low movements, defensive movement movements. So things like sumos and squats and things like that. So those things are dynamic warm up uh, and encourage the athletes do those because they develop a good balance uh, and also good flexibility and other things that they need agility over time. So I encourage dynamics. We also have athletes that like spiky balls. They use the hard or soft spiky balls or even a tennis ball or foam rollers. So you may see athletes out there. There's plenty of information on the internet on how to use those. We may put something up on Oz was showing people how to use those, but any good strength and conditioning coach or personal trainers probably going to be able to give you some information around using those. So once we've done our warm up with younger kids, I tend to run fun games. We have plenty of fun games here on the Oswish YouTube channel. So make sure I'll put a card there so you can check out some of those games. So make sure you take a look at those if you're working with middle schoolers. So that's something for teachers uh, to check out. So our very next thing that we would look at uh, would be our individual skills. So what we do is we break down our individual skills. Now we have a number of pillars in our sport that we tend to focus on. So what we focus on from an individual perspective is individual defense and footwork. So body movement fundamentals. We focus on ball handling, passing, shooting, and any number of types of shot techniques and also shots, so runners, floaters, euros, a bit more advanced moves depending on if they're at the academy level. If they're rookies, we tend to focus more on correct footwork and building dexterity. And we also focus on uh, rebounding is one of the other core skills that we need to teach athletes to do it at the individual level. So that's what we do with a young group, but we want to make our session fun. Last week in our last week's episode of The Coach Approach, I talked about fundamentals with a capital F-U-N. We want to make our sessions fun for our athletes. And on that note, some coaches have reached out to me in the past and asked, how do you cater for kids that are social players so they're not looking to play in representative teams or become NBA players, and you've got another group who are highly competitive and they're in rep teams, how do you cater for both of those when they're in the one training group? What I can tell you there is it's all basketball. So what I would do is I would make all training things that we do, games and or other, competitive. So time and score. When you give purpose to what you do, you'll find that your social kids will buy into the game and your representative kids will buy into the competitive side of it. So winners and losers is not a bad thing. Um, because that ultimately is the game at all levels. You are going to win games, you're going to lose games. So what you want to do is set up situations where you do have winners and losers and you match that against time and score, how you win, how you lose. And you'll find that you'll cater to both by doing that. So if you're just doing fundamental skill drills, your rep kids are probably going to be bored with that. If you're just doing competitive drills, your social kids are going to be bored with that. So you've got to get a fine balance. It is a balancing act, particularly at a young uh, age group, if you're coaching a young age group. All right. So after we've taught or focused on our individual sections, and we may well focus on 
those uh, each of those things, or we may just pick a couple based on what's important now. Now, last week I mentioned this concept of winning. If you're a youth coach, not focusing so much on the scoreboard, but focusing on what's important now, which with our skills matrix here at Oswish, which I will share in a future episode, a skills matrix with you, we focus on progression. So we look at where our athletes are at and where we want to take them. So you need to consider when you're teaching the individual skills and your team stuff, what level they're at, but also what is important now and what's next. So that's extremely important. Our next component of our training session is our team structure stuff. So what we do is we look at our breakdowns of screening actions or passing cuts, or we, we start to develop our two manning three men gain principles and those things will evolve into with our older group the progression will come into plays baseline sideline plays and running offenses and things of that nature so different age groups we focus on obviously different training sessions uh, programs so you need to cater to the level that you're coaching so different levels have different approaches so youngest level for us fun at a middle level where they're refining some of their skills we want a really good balance of competitive and challenging drills that are going to move them on to the next level and at the senior level where they're more highly skilled everything for us is competitive so if it's not time and score then we're not getting the best out of our athletes we find that is the best method to use um, and then the last session component for us is our team defensive stuff and that would be uh, where we teach our structures. So whether you're teaching split line, pack line, um, your zone defences, whatever your style of defence is, that is your opportunity to then break that down for the athletes. At the end of our training session, we look to run scrimmages, particularly with our older group. At the younger group, we will run small-sided games. It could even just be one-on-one, two-on-two, three-on-three. Could be a fun, modified, competitive uh, activity or game but we want again time and score and we want them to be applying what they've been learning in either that session that day or uh, over the course of our periodization so what we do at Oswish is we have blocks of eight weeks and we do what we call periodization where we actually pick things to work on each and every eight weeks so that's a that's a bit broader than your day-to-day training session that we're talking about here today so once we've scrimmaged we often bring our players in together they may do a warm warm down or we encourage them to do that in their own time but we do come together with our younger group often to build rapport we'll have them do what's called a philosopher's walk so we have them match up with someone or pair up and have them walk the court to talk about what they've learnt that day so they're reinforcing what they've they've actually taken away from the session and we find that a really good activity for our younger athletes Uh, as i said earlier i will give you a blank template of how we structure our session for you to just fill in and you can use that for your planning of your training session so if you're a beginner coach and or teacher then hopefully that'll help you as a foot in the door and a head start of your next season working with your athletes. So this has been another episode of The Cage Approach. I've enjoyed having your company. If you've got any questions, feel free to throw them in the comments below, or you can reach out to us on any of our social medias. Our social links are available on our YouTube channel. That's it, another episode of The Coach Approach. Hopefully we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for checking out this episode of The Coach Approach. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please take time to leave a like, hit the subscribe button if you haven't yet subscribed, and also feel free to share your own experience in the comments below. We hope to see you again in the next one.